Hello, I'm Rod Butler. Welcome to Let God Speak. American writer Harper Lee in her classic 1960 Pulitzer Prize winning novel, To Kill a Mockingbird, has one of her characters say, you can choose your friends, but you sure can't choose your family. Sometimes our relationships with family members can be very difficult to say the least, but we can find peace in such circumstances. Today, we're going to look at a remarkable story of a young man who grew up in a very troubled, dysfunctional family and how he found peace among the hardship. To discuss this topic today, we have Andrew Russell and Adrian Craig. Welcome, gents. Thank you. Yeah. But before we start any discussion, let's bow our heads for prayer. Gracious Father, as we discuss this important topic and open the Word of God, we ask please for the Holy Spirit to give us wisdom and understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, Joseph suffered rejection, physical and verbal abuse from his brothers, he suffered slavery, false accusation and imprisonment. He could have become embittered and hateful, but instead he, be, he was positive and hopeful. We're going to look into his remarkable life and how he prevailed. But first of all, who was Joseph, Andrew? Um, well, let's start with our Bibles. Let's go to Genesis chapter 30 and let's see how the Bible introduces him here. Genesis chapter 30 and uh, verse 25 and 26. It says, And it came to pass when Rachel had born Joseph that Jacob said unto Laban, Send me away that I may go unto mine own place and to my country. Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served thee. And let me go, for thou knowest my service which I have done thee, or which I have done for you. So, um, look, Joseph was uh, born in an area called, uh, or in a place called Paddan Aran, which was in um, the upper Mesopotamia area, known as the Fertile Crescent. And he was the 11th son of Jacob. And uh, interesting story around, uh, you know, Joseph's uh, family there was that um, Jacob himself had been um, tricked into marrying a woman by the name of Leah, when in fact he was in love with her her sister Rachel, okay? They were the daughters of Laban, who we just read about. And so, um, yeah, and a very interesting kind of family dynamic. Jacob's tricked, marries the, uh, Leah instead of Rachel, then has to, um, uh, you know, work for Rachel, serve Laban for an extra amount of time because of his love for Rachel. Rachel was his first love, okay? Rachel was his first, he was the one, she was the one, sorry, that... Um, Jacob actually wanted to marry. And um, Joseph then is the firstborn of Rachel. And so Joseph actually has a special place in his father Jacob's heart. So how many wives did Jacob have, Adrian? Oh, he actually had four. He had the two sisters plus their maids. And uh, this created an interesting dynamic, quite a contentious environment. Mm -hmm. And um, it wasn't happy. Uh, you got the two sisters actually contending for the affections of, uh, of Jacob. And the text very clearly says in chapter 29, verse 30, that H, um, uh, Jacob loved Rachel more than Leah. So this was the, the basis for the continual bickering and what have And plus the fact that uh, Leah bore more children than Rachel. Rachel was barren for quite some time. So she mm. wanted children. And so the other two wives being maids... What sort of family atmosphere was there growing up in this household with, with four wives which were yeah. not getting on? An interesting dynamic. One of the practices of that time, um, Rod, is uh, you know, that uh, men would take concubines and those concubines were essentially to produce children, essentially. You know? So, um, yeah, there's this, um, as uh, Adrian just mentioned, there's this... Uh, desire to please uh, the husband, please Jacob, and, and they want to have more children than the other, a bit of a competitiveness there, and, and the children actually grow up in this environment, 
this competitiveness between the wives. Um, it's yeah, it, it's it's an environment of conflict, and so. Of course, uh, you know, when children grow up in that kind of environment, it creates an impression, doesn't it? It uh, creates an impression on their character. They're not in a, uh, growing up in a home that's peaceful, uh, where everyone's getting on well. Um, yeah, it has the potential to, to work against their, um, their, the formation of their own good characters in the process. Yeah, they tend to model the behaviour of their, their parents, don't they? Mm. If parents are arguing, they'll be argumentative. Very sad. So apart from living this argumentative, uh, contentious family life, were there any external traumas this family faced, Adrian? Yeah, well, jo- Joseph is, uh, is uh, six years old and his oldest brother's 13, so there's quite a number of children very quick. And uh, they had to flee, uh, they elected to go back to... Um, the family land, that was the direction that Jacob had received and he disappeared unbeknownst to Laban. So Laban chases them. And so the, the boys are concerned about uh, all of that's in, all is involved in that. Um, his uncle Laban chasing them and he's upset because some of the gods have been taken. Plus the fact that um, after a while, uh, when he's going back to his land, uh, Esau, uh, the, the brother of Jacob, chases him with 400 men. So jo- Joseph's seeing all this sort of thing. Mm. So it, it wasn't a very happy environment. Children are very observant, aren't they? Yeah, that would have been quite a stressful thing to, to see uh, your uncle with 400 men coming towards you to do harm. Mm. And then seeing the family separated, so if one group got attacked, the other group would be safe, have a very powerful impression on you. Yeah. Quite stressful. Yeah. Yeah. What else? Sorry, what else went wrong in the family? Um, Well, um, Jacob moves his family um, close to, I guess, some of the other peoples, the Canaanites. Um, He uh, bought uh, some land just outside the Canaanite city of uh, Shechem, the Bible tells us. Um, and actually what happened there was um, his daughter was raped uh, by the uh, son of the ruler of, um, of Shechem there. And um, yeah, a, it creates a, a huge drama because um, uh, his other sons, um, Simeon and Levi, they actually um, take this uh, deeply to heart and they actually go and, um, and slaughter um, these men from this particular city in regard to what they've done. They tricked them and they, and they slaughter them. And of course, Jacob is greatly grieved by what he sees happening. And so this is all, all part of that in, environment, um, all part of that, uh, I guess, that, that discordant note. You know, it's kind of carrying through now. You know? yeah. Other things have happened and now this is what's uh, happening in the context of that family environment as this, well. This slaughter of Shechem, it's pretty sobering to think Simeon and Levi were teenagers. Yeah. And they could carry out such an atrocity as teenagers. I can't believe it. It's, it's uh, quite astounding. In fact, Joseph was so worried, sorry, Jacob was so worried, it says in verse 30, mm. uh, Genesis uh, 34 and verse 30, and Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have troubled me to make me to stink among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites. And I being few in number, they shall gather themselves together against me and slay me, that I shall be destroyed and I in my house. So this was such a terrible atrocity that Jacob feared he'd be annihilated. He feared for his own life retaliation. and the life of his family. That's right. How did the death of Rachel affect J- uh, Joseph? It meant now that uh, uh, the father, Jacob, is uh, giving all his affections to Joseph and Rightly so, or maybe not rightly so, he, he favoured him because he was the son of his favourite wife, Rachel. Mm. Yeah. And I, and I think um, while we readily acknowledge that he was spoilt, he was petted on by his father, I think we must also acknowledge there's some very attractive things about Joseph, and that's probably one of the reasons why his father favoured him. Not only was it the, well, not only was he the son of his favourite wife, but he was also a very attractive person. 
And we missed a step too, Adrian. Just take us back to what actually happened to Rachel. Well, Rachel actually died in childbirth, so she was producing the second son. Benjamin, yeah. Uh, Benjamin, yes, the son of my sorrow, yep. or the son of my right hand, as uh, Jacob renamed him. Mm. And uh, so um, this is not too good for Jacob. So you can see how the beloved wife of Jacob, Rachel, um, her, her son, Joseph, is favoured because she's now dead. That was a, a constant reminder. Of his beloved wife. Of his yeah. beloved wife. Yeah. Did Joseph himself, you mentioned Adrian had some good qualities, but did he do anything himself to stir up his brothers? Um, we would probably classify him as a telltale. Yeah. He was uh, ever ready to report to his dad on the behaviour of his brothers. Yeah. And that didn't impress them at all. No, no. We can read that in Genesis 37 verse 2. <clears throat> There, these are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah. They were the two um, secondary wives in the home, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. So he's a bit of a tattletale, and uh, the boys regard him, you know, his brothers regard him as a bit of a, a daddy's boy, if you like. And I think, Rod, the concern of the brothers was uh, probably exemplified in the coat that he made, that Jacob made for Joseph. Mm. They suspected that since that he was the oldest son of his favourite wife, he was going to get the inheritance, mm. the birthright. And that's what they were really concerned about. So you've got a favoured son who looks like he's being spoiled, could get the inheritance. What else did he do to stir up his brothers? Anything else? Well, he, we, well, I think we mentioned that he reported uh, yeah. misbehaviour. What he classified as misbehaviour, whatever that was, it doesn't tell us. Yeah, yeah that's what he snitched. <laughs> I read in uh, Genesis um, 37, it talks about too that he had a couple of dreams. And in these dreams, these dreams are dreams showing, uh, they were figurative of his brothers and family worshipping him. Now, if you've got a, if you're already considered to be a favoured son and you're already stirring up your brothers and now you're telling them these dreams where you're going to worship me, mm. um, this is not a good situation to, uh, to be in as a family. Yeah. So let's do a stock take right now of the family. We've got a situation where we've got um, Joseph, who's the uh, second youngest. Mm -hmm. You've got Jacob, who has been lax as a disciplinarian with his sons. You then got the wives, which are argumentative and idolatrous. You've got um, Rachel, the beloved wife. She's dead, but she was a thief. You got the, the 10 sons and they were deceptive. They were uh, revengeful. They were immoral, uh, violent, uh, envious, cruel, contentious, yeah. contentious, uh, turbulent. Then you got um, Reuben, the firstborn. There was an incident in the Bible where it talks about he um, sleeps with one of Jacob's wives, so he's, a, right. he's an incestuous uh, a fornicator. That's right. Then you got the next two brothers, Simeon and Levi. They're mass murderers. The next seven brothers, they're accessories to murder. Uh, they're thieves and slave traders because they got rid of Joseph and they took all these Shechemites uh, captive. Mm. Then you got the daughter, Dina, a child, She's in disgrace because she's been raped. Yeah. Um, and Joseph, a favoured son, well, he's there with all his ten brothers hating him, except uh, Benjamin, of course. Yeah. This doesn't sound like a family that's uh, harmonious and big and happy. Yeah. There's relationship tensions everywhere. So as a family, this, this was a very tense family. Now, to use a metaphor, the guns loaded was an event which could have triggered the gun. Yes, there was. And Jacob was concerned about his sons because they're close by Shechem where two of the boys had done this mass murder. So he was concerned that the reprisals, payback didn't take place. So he sent, I, I would say unwisely, but he sent Joseph to check them out. Mm -hmm. And that was, uh, that was the uh, event that ignited the explosion, so to speak, or right. the gun. So it? tell us the event. To keep an eye on them, right, Adrian? And then, 
And, it, and that's what actually led to what you mentioned to, uh, just before, Rod. Um, they ended up despising him. They were jealous of him and they decided to sell him into slavery. Um, if we read Genesis um, chapter 37, you've mentioned chapter 37. I don't think we rent, read it there, but verse 19 to 20 says, And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh, come now therefore, and let us slay him and cast him into some pit. And, and we will say some evil beast has devoured him and we shall see what will become of his dreams. Yes, yeah, so um, things have clearly uh, reached boiling point here. And of course, they, uh, well, they actually want to kill him at first, but Reuben actually uh, reasons with him and says, no, uh, let's, let's hold off on that. But he eventually gets sold into slavery um, yeah, to some slave traders and ends up in Egypt. As well, what, Reuben actually intended to take him out of the pit. Mm. Yeah. But uh, while Reuben was somewhere else, whatever he's doing, I don't know. Uh, Judah said, is there opportunity? Let's sell him to the Ishmaelites. So this is a, a terrible calamity for, for Joseph. It's a horrible thing. What was the impact on Joseph? How did he handle this situation? Well, he's very... Uh, we, can, we can only imagine how he felt mm. going on uh, off with these slave traders, uh, leaving his dad... Uh, he's only a teenager. Um, yeah, horrible situation. But the important thing to note is that it was a turning point in Joseph's life. He realised that he'd been petted and spoilt and he made a commitment of his uh, life to Jesus as he journeyed down to Egypt. 400 kilometre journey to, to Egypt from where the slave traders picked him up. And yeah, I think we, it's important to remember that even though this family is in such disarray, um, but the gospel was present there as well, you know, and, uh, and we don't f really hear an account of Joseph complaining and obviously he's distressed, you know, but um, yeah, he's not, he's not given up all hope. And mm. I'd like to share a text, Romans chapter 8, verse 28. It's a well-known text, but, um, you know, God permits sometimes these things to happen uh, for our growing. I mean, we don't live in a perfect world. Um, things do happen even in the home. But Romans 8 verse 28 um, is a well-known text amongst the, amongst the Christian community. It says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And I think it's fair to assume, um, as we read on especially regarding uh, Joseph's faith, that um, there is a foundation that's been laid. Adrian alludes to it. He reflects now and he gets to tap into uh, that God, to resolve himself to that God. I mean, that's often what we do when all is a mess, isn't it? That's all we can yeah. do. There's nothing yep. that's left for us. So we have nothing to fear for the future except we forget the past. And that's exactly what happened in Joseph's experience because Jacob had told him about the ladder. Mm. God was with him and he too was fleeing from his brother. And he, and he told him about um, the uh, experience of Chabok when he wrestled with the angel. So these things were... Uh, these things, these incidents, these events in the life of his father gave him confidence in the God of his father would be his God. Mm. Mm. I'd just like to also read a text. It's Psalm 29 and verse 11. Psalm 29 verse 11 says, The Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. So Joseph's given his heart to the Lord and God gave Joseph peace. Mm. He didn't know what was going to happen to him. But he had that peace that God was in control. That's right. Can I add to that, Rod, just yeah. quickly? Um, Philippians 4, verse 11, it says, um, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Yeah. So when you've got God with you, there can be all sorts of things happening around you. Yes. But you've got that peace that comes from God alone. I, I think it's remarkable, Rod, that Joseph had all these disadvantages. I mean, the family was, the family was a mess. Mm. In spite of all that, this man determined that he's going to stand true. Yes, yes. Well, let's keep moving. Joseph now goes down to Egypt and he's sold to an Egyptian called Potiphar. Who was Potiphar? Potiphar was the captain of uh, the, uh, the guard of the king. He was a very high official in uh, the, uh, the government of Egypt. He was, in a sense, in charge of Pharaoh's security. 
and in charge of prisons. Right. Okay. So what was Joseph's experience in the household of Potiphar? Uh, let's read from Genesis chapter 39 there, Rod, verses 2 um, to 4. Genesis chapter 39, verse 2 to 4. It says here, And the Lord was with Joseph. That's very clear. And he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him, and he made him overseer over his house and all that he had put into his hand. So Joseph's experience initially is, um, is a very positive one. Um, his master sees here that he was a man of integrity. He was a man that, um, I mean, that, uh, Joseph obviously attributes his, uh, you know, everything he has to his God and Potiphar, it seems to, he can't argue with that. Mm. You know, he sees this man has a certain integrity when it comes to his faith and his God and that God has blessed this man. And so Potiphar puts great confidence in Joseph, um, as it said there, uh, giving his entire household to, to his care. So in other words, he's, so he, he's second to Potiphar himself. So here's, here's Joseph in a high official's household. He's now running the household. Yes. And being a high official, he would have learnt the culture. He Absolutely. would have learnt... Uh, the affairs of the state of Egypt and the politics and the diplomacy. Life must have been really good. What could possibly go wrong? Well, this was actually going to stand him in good stead for what was coming too. So what could go wrong? Well, according to the text, he is uh, eyed by the wife of Potiphar. Mm. He was very attractive, very handsome. And according to what the text says in chapter 39, she pestered him. And uh, the angels are watching. What's going to happen? I, I, I could imagine the angels are holding their breath and saying, what's he going to do? What's he going to do? And of course, we know the classic response from uh, Joseph. He says, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against my God? Mm. Mm. But the Lord was with him. And that's something we ought to note, uh, Rod, in chapter 39, the number of times it says the Lord was with Joseph. Mm. The Lord was with Joseph. There's a key point here too. Joseph was getting his self-esteem his self-worth by what? By how God saw him, by his yeah. relationship with God, mm. not how other people viewed him. I mean, he was going out on a limb here. He was rejecting the advances of uh, Mrs. Potiphar. Yes. This had serious consequences for him. Either way, he was in, in deep trouble. Yeah. Um, but he put his faith in God and his self-worth, his self-esteem was based in his relationship with God. Yeah. And that's another clue how he endured trials in hard times because it doesn't matter what's going around us, our, our value, our worth is how God sees us. Yeah, yeah. And he took to heart what the John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Yeah. That so was what was the consequences of refusing the advances of uh, Mrs. Potiphar? He was accused of rape. Um, she accused him of rape. Um, she felt uh, that he didn't uh, obviously do her bidding as he should have and um, yeah it had dire consequences because Joseph ended up being thrown in prison as a result. Now it actually should have meant that he um, was, he should have actually received the death penalty for something like that mm. um, being a, a servant or a slave in the house of this uh, great general but um, Potiphar by this stage he'd been with Potiphar around 10 years or so uh, Potiphar has seen enough of his character mm. um, and Potiphar chooses not to go in that direction with Joseph but to save face throws him in prison gets rid of him and what a, what a great witness for the God of Jacob yeah. um, was Joseph's character so what did he do in prison well he was he behaved as he'd already been behaving he, he did his work uh, in a very acceptable fashion. And uh, what happened in Potiphar's house happened in the prison. He mm. became in charge of the prison responsibilities. And it was all part of his learning experience, learning what, what, it, what it meant to give compassion and what have you. And I think the text very clearly indicates that while he was in the prison, he was attentive to the, to the needs of the people of the prison. Because he noticed a couple of fellows who looked as if they weren't too happy. And so he inquired, why are you sad? Mm. 
Yeah. Look, it's interesting too, who was in charge of the prisons? It was Potiphar. And we read in the, in the text that Joseph rises through the, I guess, the ranks of the prison to yeah. be the prison keeper's right-hand man. Yeah. And pretty soon Joseph, who was running part of his house, is now looking after prison affairs for the prisoners. And his integrity is shining through in the most difficult of circumstances. God is shaping his character there. Yes. It's amazing what God is doing in his life. So how long did Joseph spend in prison? Well, he probably thought he was there for life, Rod, mm. because of what had happened. But um, he was there. Well, I don't know that we know the exact length of time, but we do know that he was there for two more years after the dreams of the butler and the baker. Mm. Mm. So yeah. That's an important point because um, every day would have woken up in prison and he still had to decide, do I follow God or not? Here I am in prison. And he did. Mm. And I guess the message for us today is that we can be having calamities all around us and they might never go away. Yes. Will that affect our relationship with God? No, we should mm. still hang on to God. Mm. Um, did God have a purpose for having Joseph in prison? Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes we can't see tomorrow, but God can. And here God is establishing him even in prison. Um, and of course, eventually um, his reputation um, is heard about in the king's court beyond, beyond this. But um, yeah, God's doing his work in establishing yeah. um, one who continues to look to him. By he's food. getting to understand the administrative uh, mm. procedures and the customs yeah. and the language of Egypt. Yeah. And we read before, um, you know, Joseph finds grace in the sight of God. Grace is God's favour, you know, and we ought to l always lend ourselves to the knowledge that God has favour toward us. God's loving kindness is extended to us. Uh, God's good will continues to extend to us no matter what the circumstances. Yeah, so he had, he had lessons to learn. He had to learn lessons of justice, compassion, um, faith. Yes. Faith that God's in control. Mm. Well, that's all we have time for today. Joseph suffered terrible setbacks caused by other people. But despite what happened to him, he held on to God no matter what. Joseph's character was shaped by his trials and today we all suffer trials and afflictions, but we can find rest in difficult relationships by hanging on to God, by claiming his promises in the Bible. During trials, we'll get to see our character flaws close up and through God's grace, we can overcome them. We're glad you're with us today on Let God Speak. You can watch any past program on our website, 3abnaustralia.org.au. Teachers Helps can be downloaded from there. You can email us on lgs at 3abnaustralia.org.au. God bless. You have been listening to Let God Speak, a production of 3ABN Australia Television. To catch up on past programs, please visit 3abnaustralia.org.au. Call us in Australia on 02 4973 3456 or email radio at 3abnaustralia.org.au We'd love to hear from you.